paradoxically, to promote healthy ageing in the latter years, what you do very early in the life course, the first 20, 25 years, probably matters a great deal. I love what I do. I mean, you know, I'm 41 now and I, I look better than I did when I was in my 20s. Oh, I saw this thing the other day, this product. I was somewhere and it said that um, due to a biotechnic advancement, there was this product that reduced ageing on a nuclear level. Now the tourniquet will just be a bit firm, it's not yep. going to hurt. And just pinch your hand just for a moment and we'll just cleanse the skin and just let it air dry. I'm Noelle McCarthy. This is A Wrinkle in Time. A Wrinkle in Time. A Wrinkle in Time. Now looking at you, you look very fit and vital, so um, if you're not exactly what your chronological age is, um, you'll be around that, or I expect um, maybe a little younger. A podcast series about ageing in a world that wants us to stay young. Dear Ellen, it's me, Ellen, writing to you from the age of 26. How are things in the future? Hello, 70-year-old Tim. Are you living on a farm in the Hawke's Bay like you always wanted to? Did you get married? Did it work? Is Facebook still a thing? Did you find a job that mattered, or did you choose lifestyle over work? Mate. Did you spend enough time with your family? I trust this finds you well and that you're sitting pretty from all that Kiwi saver money. Did you keep the same group of friends? And that you've paid off your student loan? Did you try to be nice to people? That you've gotten over your fear of the IRD? Did you have children? I hope my relentless finger clicking hasn't given you arthritis in all of your knuckles, not to mention your thumbs and wrists from those god-awful smartphones. How do we want to age? And how much say do we have in it? Maddie, Zach, Tim and Ellen are all in their 20s. They're talking to their future selves in their 70s and 80s. I hope you're driving the white Porsche you dreamed of having in fourth form. I hope you bought a lot of people uh, a lot of happiness. Um, and I hope you still laugh a lot. I hope you've grown your grey hair long like Holly Hunter in Top of the Lake. I don't have a lot to say to you because I have complete confidence that the life you have lived will have been a satisfying one, full of friends, travel, literature, leopard print coats and red lipstick. Whatever pre-Blade Runner, post-internet world you're living in, I can only hope that you're happy and healthy and that you've trusted your instincts, made the most of every opportunity. Did you figure out how to poach an egg like they do in cafes? Did you get any better at surfing? Did you take life too seriously? Did you have fun? Apart from the white Porsche, Tim and Ellen and Zach and Maddie all want the same things most of us want in older age. Broadly speaking, that's health and happiness. They're in luck when it comes to the latter, at least. There's research that says we get happier as we get older. The scientists have identified something they call the U-bend of happiness. And actually, the unhappiest decade of human life, measured scientifically, is the 40s. Bill Thomas is a geriatrician. He's the founder of the Eden Alternative Philosophy, which aims to transform the way we think about supporting older people. I'm telling him about a woman that I saw struggling with her walker on the link bus in Auckland recently. What consolations, I asked him, can possibly make up for the often intense physical difficulties that come with ageing? The woman you, you notice is free of a lot of those pressures. People have a, a, a very real weakness in what's called diachronic vision. And what that means is people have a hard time imagining a future self that is not just pretty much like their current self. So what you see in an older person, maybe using a, a assistive device or a walker, um, you see somebody and compared to you right now, it seems like an enormous change. But compared to last year, that woman might be doing really well. <laughs> she might be feeling like, yeah, I'm back to riding the bus. Awesome. So the best may lie ahead for all of us. As for the health side of the equation, by the time they turn 80, not only will Ellen and the others be able to avail themselves of the latest anti-ageing drugs and therapies, they'll still have plenty of time to eat well, get lots of exercise and make healthy choices in general. But young as they are, relatively speaking, they may have set themselves up for healthy ageing already. Paradoxically, to promote healthy ageing in the latter years, what you do very early in the life course, the first 20, 25 years, probably matters a great deal. 
I'm with Professor Richie Poulton at the University of Otago. Professor Poulton is the director of the Dunedin Study, which tracks the life of nearly a thousand babies born in the city in the early 70s. For the last 40 or so years, the study's attracted consistent international notice. Last year, it provided one of the world's top science stories, when all of the participants were aged and the results surprised everyone. And what we found was fascinating. I mean, everyone was 38, that's the beauty of our study, that's a one-year cohort but they ranged enormously in terms of how biologically older, or old they were. The range ran from 28 through to 61. The huge range of biological as opposed to chronological ages in the study confirmed something most of us know already. We all wear our years differently. You can see it when you walk down the street. Some of us look old prematurely and some of us are youthful looking. It's an obvious aspect of ageing, but it's taken the Dunedin study to prove it. We were able to measure, because we have multiple assessments on our group as they've aged, measure biomarkers, 18 in our case, at age 26, 32 and 38, and take that 12-year period, that's three measurement points in 12 years, and say, do people age in terms of their trajectories at different rates across our 1,000 um, uh, sample size. How fast was the fastest rate? OK, so vis-a-vis -vis chronology, so if you think of every single year that people age, the range was from zero. So some people didn't seem to be, for every year that they lived, they didn't seem to physiologically age at all, up to three times the normal rate. So effectively three years' worth of ageing packed into one year. That's the, the far end of it. So that's quite a different rate, isn't it? Some are going very slowly, some are sort of on time. Their physiology matches their chronological um, age or the passage of time, and others are really racing ahead. The big question, of course, is why some of the subjects are growing older faster than others. This is a question the Dunedin study, with its mountains of data, collected over four decades, is beautifully positioned to answer. Um, of course, because we've got our measure at, eight, at um, late 30s, um, that gives us the ability to also go back in time, because we have measured our group since they were born. And this, is, this bears on your question about what are the causes or the yes. things to blame. Um, we can go back in time and ask questions. Now that we've established the measure of pace of ageing, what predicts differences in pace of ageing? Is it living in uh, socioeconomically deprived circumstances when you grow up? Is it being subjected to various forms of maltreatment? Uh, as you've been growing up? Is it because you started using substances and have become a chronically dependent person on various substances? So sort of social or psychological Social, factors. behavioural, psychological, a whole bunch of factors. Of course, you, there are physical indicators as well from early in life that may suggest that you're on a, um, a rapid trajectory for ageing. So we've got the ability to look across the physical domain, the, the, the social domain, the behavioural domain, uh, and ask pretty um, in-depth questions as to what are the key factors driving um, pace of ageing before people get ill. This is the value of the study in a nutshell. Tracking rates of ageing in younger people has massive potential benefits, not just for individuals, but for countries currently grappling with health costs of ageing populations. By asking one simple question, how do we measure ageing in young people, Professor Poulton and his colleagues have changed the paradigm for ageing research. We're almost uniquely, I think, in the world positioned um, to ask and answer questions about what factors early in life predict poor ageing by midlife, before people get chronically ill. Now, the factors we're interested in are what we call modifiable factors, in particular. So, for example, if sex, male or female, was one of the key drivers, we can't really change people's sex. It's not an easy easy thing to do. You go to your GP and just have that done. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at uh, things that are modifiable because then that would inform governments and policy makers and practitioners as to what they should focus their attention on and their resources on. If certain types of risk factors are strongly related to being on an accelerated ageing path and delaying ageing, delayed the burden of disease in the population, that's what you put your money into early in life. Paradoxically, to promote healthy ageing in the latter years, what you do very early in the life course, the first 20, 25 years, probably matters a great deal.
Up until now, the research has tended to focus on adults in middle age or over. But what the Dunedin study is showing is that when you're studying healthy ageing, the earlier you start, the better. Whilst that would run counter to conventional wisdom today, I would imagine in five to ten years people will um, accept that as a entirely reasonably a reasonable and sane proposition. Mm. Right now it's a little different from what people um, tend to think. And I understand that. I mean, it, to put it in lay terms, I mean, if you're studying ageing in very old people, the horse is out the barn. So is it nature or nurture? How much do the Dunedin researchers think the rate of ageing is determined by our choices and our circumstances, and how much by the genes we're born with? Cutting-edge research about gene environment interplay suggests that there's no such thing as determinism, genetic or environmental for that matter. Um, and that basically boils down to um, a takeaway message, which is you can make a difference. Your genetic endowment will provide you with some parameters or a range of possible outcomes. Um, so you've got a range of possibilities, and then what happens to you in your life, whether you do get enough sleep, whether you avoid the substances of abuse, whether you have a great diet, whether you exercise, and so on. And these are the obvious candidates, but I'm sure we'll find out new things in this burgeoning area of science. I mean, for example, calorific restriction is regarded mm. as a really interesting phenomenon that they see in animals. You know, if you reduce the amount of calories... Periods of fasting. Periods of fasting, yeah, exactly. For some reason, it prolongs um, lifespan as well as health span. Uh, so we've all got options. We've all got strategies that we could bring to bear that will make things better or longer. Nothing is deterministic. Uh, and, uh, you it's know, not written in stone. It's not written in stone. And the, the faster we can get away from that very black and white thinking about stuff being written in stone, the better. That's good news, right? Potentially, we've all got some control over how we age. And knowledge can be power in this situation. If you're on track for rapid ageing and you can take steps to slow it down, wouldn't knowing your biological age be useful? Well, it depends on how far along you are. I used to do lots of things. After a certain point, knowing you're ageing fast may not be good for you. Personally, I think I'm um, on the wrong end of the my chronological age <laughs> distribution. Uh, you can tell I'm a little, you know, a little chubby and all that sort of stuff. So I haven't done the right thing in terms of always <laughs> exercising and eating well. It's the old story. If you can do something about it, by all means, tell me. But if you um, if you can't do it or feel you can't do something about it, mm, you know. All that's going to do is make you feel lousy and, and, or anxious. And most people would tend to prefer that, you know, leave me in the dark on it. Um, I probably need to do it, given that mm. people are very surprised that I haven't, including yourself. The pressure is so, on. So the, pre the pressure's on. So I think, you've, I think I, it's inevitable that this will happen, and I will do it as part of the uh, Phase 45 preparations, because we run pilots and we use ourselves to make yes. sure the tests are running smoothly. So that's when I'll do it. See, I've got, a, I've got a few months between now and then to try and get in better shape. <laughs> to get ready. Well, the professor may have some time to gear up for his test, but for me, it's now or never. Oh, I think this cuff will be the right size. You just, you're almost a small cuff. But just the right size, I think. So, Tim, just let your arm relax. Do you need to take much? No, we only need to take a couple of teaspoons. It's not much at all. The Dunedin team agreed to age me for this episode. Because they didn't have data from my 20s, they weren't going to be able to give me an exact pace of ageing. But they could give me a biological age, just like the subjects in the study got. The tests were done on a rainy day in Dunedin back in March by Associate Professor Bob Hancocks at the Department of Preventative and Social Medicine at the University of Otago. We started with blood pressure and then moved on to lung function. Now, what I'm going to get you to do is um, just take a really big breath in, all the way, feel your lungs right to the top, then seal your lips around there, get a really good seal, okay, and then just blow it as hard and as fast as you can and keep going until I tell you to stop. Okay. Okay, big breath in, in all the way, all the way, seal your lips around the mouthpiece and blow it, blast out, blast out, blast out, keep going, keep going, keep going, don't stop, don't stop, keep going, keep going, keep going, just a couple more seconds, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, and... 
the stop. Oh well done. Goodness. Did I do it? Oh. Yeah. See, it's come up with a good blow. After the surprisingly difficult lung test, yeah, no, it was down the street to Southern to Community pay. Labs. Now the tourniquet will just be a bit firm. It's not yep. going to hurt. And just pinch your hand just for a moment. And we'll just cleanse the skin and just let it air dry. Denise has been taking the blood samples for the Dunedin study for more than two decades now. I was in very safe hands. Hold that very firmly so it doesn't bruise. That's lovely, thank you. No, thank you. That wasn't so bad. So how old am I? We'll get to that. Certainly, the professor got my hopes up. Looking at you, you look very fit and vital, so um, if you're not exactly what your chronological age is, you'll be around that, or I expect um, maybe a little younger. If the professor is right, I've got nothing to worry about. And why shouldn't he be right? I have good habits. I eat well, I exercise three or four times a week, I don't drink, I get eight hours sleep, I do all the right things. Well, I do these days. I used to crash parties and Maseratis and I, I was evil. I wasn't always such a good girl, though, and maybe my 20s are about to come back to haunt me. What if I get a test result that says I'm in my 40s? It's only a few years older than my chronological age of 37 years, four months and counting. And how old is that even? It's not quite middle age, I don't think. But what is middle age anyway? If my life expectancy is in the late 80s, then middle age is mid-40s. I'm not ready to be in my mid-40s. I'm barely ready to acknowledge that I'm in my mid-30s. My mother had four children when she was my age. What if I don't have time to have any? What if I'm already 40 or older in my body? It feels silly to worry about this. I know that I'm young, relatively speaking, and that getting to middle age means that I'm lucky. If this was the Middle Ages, I'd be dead already. But being older than you think you are feels like losing time unfairly. Like when you just get used to writing down one year and you realise we're already into another. You can press pause on time for the period that you're having the treatments. Uh, and then when or if you feel like you want to just let it fade off, you can. I'm sitting in the consulting room of Dr Catherine Stone, looking into a terrifyingly powerful mirror. So the first thing I'd look at doing is probably a little bit of Botox just through the frown. Possibly a tiny through, the, tiny little bit through the forehead lines, um, but it would really only be a tiny, tiny bit because I, I don't want to lose this, and it would be specifically just in the central part here. Dr Stone was an early Australasian pioneer of the giving and the receiving of Botox. I love what I do. I mean, you know, I'm 41 now, and I, I look better than I did when I was in my 20s. Uh, I have Botox and dermal fillers and, and skin treatments like uh, our Omnilux light treatments um, to help um, improve my skin so I don't have to put makeup on every day. Dr Stone now offers a range of treatments at her Auckland clinic. Everything from dermal fillers to so-called vampire facials, which use plasma from your own blood to give your skin a glow. And if you have a wee look in the mirror, if you frown in for me, frown in hard, you can see when you frown in, there's a muscle starts here, on you it comes out to here. On this side starts here, it comes right out to here. And those two squeeze in, they make the vertical lines. There's a third muscle as part of the frown, it sits in the middle, it squeezes down, makes the lines across the top of your nose. Now, these create what is called your frown line. So this is your corrugator muscle, this is your other corrugator muscle, and this is your procerus muscle. When we're doing Botox, we're treating the muscles, not the lines. So occasionally when we treat through here, we can find that we get a very subtle lift through the brow. That tends to make people look more approachable. Despite the increasing popularity and accessibility of Botox and fillers, Dr Stone acknowledges you can't really cheat time entirely. There was a fantastic um, presentation that uh, one of the guys did at one of the conferences where he had 10 faces in a row which just side by side flashed them up in about half a second, just like that. And every, he went round um, and asked everyone in the room which was the oldest face out of the two. And we, everybody got 10 out of 10 pretty much um, because 
it's a subconscious thing that our body picks up in terms of the changes that happen to, in our face as we age. Um, so it can be things like the change in proportion of the thirds um, and the shortening of the chin and, and the hollowing in through here, the hollowing in through here, the flattening of the cheeks um, uh, are picked up at a subconscious level, which is also why I think it's... You see these people um, sometimes who maybe have a 50-year-old frame on their face or a 60-year-old frame and they turn around and they've got like a 20-year-old a lip and it just doesn't look right. You, your subconscious is going, hey, there's something not quite right with this. That being said, what can she do for me? I start with a little through the frown, tiny little bit through the forehead and maybe a little on the side just to open that eye up just a little bit more because um, you have beautiful eyes and we want to show them off. Possibly a tiny little bit of Botox through your chin. Would I need much? Tiny. Just a little bit. Tiny, nice. yeah. Mm -hmm. So with me through that area would probably be about 168 dollars. I was surprised that there was so much Dr Stone could potentially do for and to me, but I shouldn't have been. Many of her clients are younger than I am now and many are older. The 20s is more about enhancement. 30s is people just starting to notice those changes coming in and going, mm, I'm not really liking what I'm seeing, I just want to know that I can do something about it. Um, and also starting to look at the prevention side of things. Um, 40s, we get a lot of the same. And then your know, 50s and 60s um, uh, obviously are coming in with a different expectation. That often they're going to have more dermal fillers um, and they'll often, we'll spend a bit more time with them on the skin side of things as well. One of my favourite uh, ladies came in for her 80th birthday, rocked on in wearing like purple sneakers and, no, she was wearing green sneakers with purple laces. Um, and you could tell that she just had this youthfulness of who she was um, that just wasn't matching with how her face was when she looked in the mirror. It's that disconnect between how we feel and what we see that can make interventions like Botox an attractive proposition. And what about how others see us? The face to meet the faces that you meet, as the poem goes. It's all very well Bill Thomas quoting me the you bend of happiness theory. But what if we're only happier because we make the best of a tough situation? All of those challenges inherent in physical ageing. Some of them we all share, but there are extra dimensions for women. Menopause is possibly the most destructive thing that's ever happened to me in my life. But I feel it in my bones, as they say. Um, and I wasn't expecting to feel it quite this early. I was thinking maybe 70 my body would slow down, but yeah, I'm definitely feeling it. Wendell's feeling it sooner than she thought she would, and no wonder. In the 21st century, you can argue men are now just as conscious as women about body image. But for women, getting older will always be a different proposition. Menopause is a psychological as well as a physical upheaval. And that isn't surprising when you think about how much of our physical attractiveness, for both sexes, evolved out of the drive for procreation. Biologically, the purpose of all life is reproduction. And that drive is reflected in the span of fertility for most species. Elephants live for ages, but they keep having babies until they're in their 60s. There are only three kinds of creatures that live long lives after the end of their fertility. Killer whales, pilot whales and humans. That's amazing biologically. But whales don't have to live in a society constructed around a youthful ideal of female beauty. For women, we're only about two thirds of the way through our life by the time we hit menopause. And that's the beginning of an era when some of us reckon we also become magically invisible. I was reading oh, Helen Wormsley Johnson relatively recently. Susie's in her 60s. She started a blog called Aging Can Be a Bitch. English writer Helen Wormsley Johnson's book about ageism, The Invisible Woman, struck a chord with her. I think what she did is went to one of these really big shops like Harrods or something like that. And she went around, she didn't have any lipstick on. And she went around the shop and basically I think she felt like she was wallpaper or that's 
paraphrasing or describing. And then she did something similar after applying red lipstick and said that um, people were going out of their way to help her. and could They opened her. doors for her. They opened they? doors for her, yeah, they were doing that kind of stuff, which is really interesting because I do the red lipstick. Mm. So do you feel that pressure to be a certain way as you get older? Yeah, the pressure's definitely there. Oh, I saw this thing the other day, this product. I was somewhere and it said that um, due to a biotechnic advancement, there was this product that reduced ageing on a nuclear level. <laughs> <laughs> on a nuclear level? Yeah, on a nuclear level. I don't. Quite Have you it. any idea what that means? No, I've I got don't. no idea what that means. No idea. I took a photo of it. I was trying to work it out, but I couldn't. It's not just at surface level, that pressure. It affects how we see ourselves and it affects how we relate to each other. Do you flirt? Is there flirting? Mm, occasionally, if I notice it. Yeah. But that's an interesting thing about visibility too because I can sometimes feel that, you know, someone hovers into view that I notice and then there's that moment and then I think, oh, hang on, I'm 60-something, whatever it is, he won't be interested. No, I'll be too old for that. But Susie's experience of getting older also echoes what Bill Thomas told me. I mean, it's surreal, really, um, being 67 and saying 67 and I'm going to be 68 this year. It gets better. That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> what gets better? Um, ease of life from being in life and um, where I fit in in the world and my place in it and um, how I feel about me, really. Um, I love the, the lack of expectation. I've, I've grown my hair grey. I've let it all go. I wear Birkenstocks. I hang out however I want to, where I want to, and I no longer give a shit what anyone thinks of me. And 50 gave me that. The 50s have given me that that freedom. Uh, whereas I think in the 30s and 40s, you're still trying to be really you know, aware of yourself and, and present something to the world. I just don't bother anymore. And I, I'm the happiest I've ever been. For women especially, maybe the emotional freedom of older age comes from developing emotional toughness. From a very young age, I have been internalising all of the subtle hints the world puts out. Not good enough, not smart enough, not pretty enough, not skinny enough, not rich enough, not chill enough, not looking up enough. I hope by 80 you will have finally come to the realisation that you are enough. It's not all bad, you know, in terms of getting to a place where... Mm, I'm not sure how to articulate that, but I, I mean, there's a lovely Caitlin Moran quote, but I probably can't say it here. <laughs> you know, we may lose skin elasticity, but less Fs are given. It's on now. The days are long now. The ups and the sun downs and the twisting. Hi, Noel. I've got your test results. Your biological age, it turns out, is 36 years and four months. Maybe that's middle age. Maybe it's younger. Maybe it's older. Doesn't matter. After making this series, I feel like I have an awful lot of life to look forward to still. I didn't get Botox either. But that doesn't mean I won't in future. As my reflection changes, maybe my perspective will also. I won't know until I get there. It's an undiscovered country. That's what makes it so interesting. There's a lot of stuff written about older people, and I had a bit of a look at quite a few, you know, just checking out blogs, and most of them were about how to manage symptoms, um, how to manage retirement funds, you know, a whole range of kind of advice-giving blogs. There may be some others out there, I'm sure there are, but I've come across a couple, and I love... Um, Caitlin Moran and um, Helen's writing because they're just writing as it is really and finding out as they go along and reporting back, which is what I'm doing and I'm really interested in that. Yeah, because we're all, we're all just walking each other home. Don't let just make you wanna cry